The Opus Magnum community just finished up their weekly series. The weekly series has players competing on custom puzzles made by other community members. Traditionally, there are some strange metrics that you have to optimize, but none get more strange than the last week. The last week will have you optimizing for aesthetics and a shitpost, with the winners decided by popular vote. Now, that concluded all about a few hours ago, but the submissions are now public, and so the vote is open, but I'm not here with this video asking for you to vote for my machine. I think that this is more of a chance to just show off everything that you can build in this game, and because I put a lot of effort into my aesthetic solve and it really does capture my personal aesthetic of emergent complexity and ties to what I really love about the game, I figured I'd make a video to show it off. So here goes. So the puzzle is called Touch Grass. And that's kind of in tradition with the rest of the weeklies is that they're, they're pretty non-serious and especially for the last puzzle, I like to make something very simple. And I'm aware that it is telling us to go touch grass. And my response is to show off a really cool, complicated machine that I built in a video game. In my defense, you clicked on this video, you want to see the cool machine in the video game. So let's talk about the parts of this machine. And first, I'm just going to get rid of everything over here on the right. And I'm going to get rid of this calcifier. The output of touch grass is a zigzag polymer that is supposed to go on forever. And the way Opus Magnum works, you build things that loop. So if you're going to add a column every time you loop or add some number of columns every time you loop, you're building something that should go forever. And grabbing the inputs at top speed, stringing them together like this, does indeed make the output. There's also arms that are looking busy doing nothing right now. They'll all make sense in the full machine. But for now, I just want to show off this simple section that is making the output. Except one of the things I removed is a calcifier. So in the actual machine, it's making it wrong. It's putting salt on the bottom row, which isn't what you're supposed to be making. But okay, we'll talk about that more later. Let's look at the other part of the machine. I got rid of the output. I'm using a mod right now. I'm using a lot of mods, actually. I have a mod that'll allow me to zoom in and out. I have a mod that'll allow me to speed up and down, as I've demoed the wrong one for each. And I have a mod that allows me to run the game even if the output isn't placed. These are all available through the modding framework, but I want to make clear that this puzzle doesn't require mods and the solution that I made doesn't require mods. You could make this in game. It's just easier to show things off when you have better tooling. Anyway, on its own, this section over here uses a really cool track loop that's a hexagon around a middle piece to put earth atoms onto the glyph of animismus, making vitae and mores and then bond those together into a separate chain that gets torn apart and thrown into the disposal. So in the middle, we were seeing there be some zigzag chain that looks like the output going from left to right. And then on the top, we see a different chain that is a straight line going right to left. Cool. Now, when I said that my aesthetic is emergent complexity, what I mean by that is I really like when you take simple things and they interact with other simple things and you get a result that is not at all simple. What that means for this design is I wanted to build a chaotic feedback loop. So these two systems talk to each other in a way that gets very chaotic. First, what happens is that this Burlo wheel turns the salts into different elements. And then those elements get snatched up by the green, by the earth atoms that are becoming part of the animismus. It pulls them off of the stick and it puts them onto this hex arm where they get sent back around to the other side. I want you to pay careful attention to the speed at which this is currently moving and watch it double. Because as these things get fed back around, they are interleaved Every other column in this comes from the original mechanism, which is just throwing up salt. And then the other ones come from this feedback loop around the other side. When there's something coming around the other side, there's a duplicator here. So the salt immediately turns into a copy of whatever shows up on its left. The salt turns into an air because that's what showed up on its left. And if I tab through every single cycle, either one of the arms on top or one of the arms on the original loop is moving this to the right. Now, something traveling at what's effectively light speed in game is really hard to control. So on the other side, I really carefully built this so that at half speed and at full speed, it will successfully put things over here in this hex arm. It will prevent a crash happening even though this debonder and this bonder are going to be active on every single cycle from here on. Well, not all cycles. We'll talk about that later. 
What's more is this Moore's atom that comes from the proc of atomismus. It steals control over these two, or these, I guess, two by two, four atoms. I call it two because it's two columns. Right as soon as arm 11 debonds from it, arm 17 bonds a Morse to it and scooches it over by two more. So where arm 15 previously held two atom chunks, two by two atom chunks, is now holding two by four atom chunks. We'll watch this, this section just by itself in slow motion for a bit to watch the control go from the arm that's holding salt to the arm that's holding Moore's seamlessly. It's kind of like a zero cycle handoff because it happens by unbonding and bonding to something new. But anyway, we've been building these newer, chunkier pieces to feed back through the feedback loop, but there's no room in here anymore because it's going at top speed. So now they're going to feed back through the top. And in the top, part of them, the lower part, just replaces the atoms that were previously coming from the input, which I thought was a cute way of having the amount of material I had to work with. And then the top row of them land on this quintessence glyph. Now, if they don't comprise one each of water, earth, fire, and air, they'll get bonded up here, and this thing has enough arms in it to handle actually disposing every atom that comes by. But if they do become quintessence, which just happened, there's this quintessence atom right here, arm 54 is holding it right now. It came from creating one quintessence out of one each of earth, air, fire, water in any order. It doesn't really matter which one is which on these, it just matters that it's one of each. But if we follow what this is doing, and we'll watch it in like moderately slow-mo because it's pretty cool the movements that it has to pull off. It's going and it's going to rotate past with very close near misses all the different ways that Moore's is swinging up. Death-defying moves, death-defying moves, and it bonds right there. Note that previously, ever since we moved at double speed, this arm has been pushing through these two by four bricks. But now that a quintessence is here, it turns that off. It steals them. These bricks are gonna get stolen from this arm for now, which shuts off this double speed feedback loop and moves us back to the half speed that we were at the beginning. But once it's at half speed, Instead of grabbing two by fours, it's grabbing two by twos, which don't get stolen. So it's kind of like a reset. If the quintessence lands here, it's kind of a reset. We go back to an earlier behavior of the solution where there's a bunch of salt coming past and there's only the smaller pieces going to the left. But because it's a reset, it'll also eventually become the full deal. So if we just kind of watch at a higher speed again until we hit another reset, it'll come eventually. Here we go. There's another reset. This goes back to half speed, and then it goes back to full speed. And it's seamless. It's seamless going between half speed and full speed because this section over here was very carefully built so that even if it was half or full speed, nothing would crash. Now, a natural question is, will we ever have a successful output? We've gone through several resets by now and it hasn't created the output successfully. It's always had either airs or waters or earths or salt, or not earths, airs, waters, fires, or salts on the bottom row. But this Burlow wheel is capable of adding earth to the rotation. And the resets are capable of causing the amount of any one element to double into a contiguous blob of more than one of that element. See, we've gotten a couple of earths side by side here but they're not reappearing in the bottom. Okay, here's one that is two Earths reappearing in the bottom side by side. And we can watch as that turns into four Earths in a row in the top. Because again, way over here on the left, everything is being copied onto its neighbor. So what was two Earths in the bottom row has become four Earths. But will it become eight Earths? Well, no, because those are getting thrown out. All of this stuff here that has been diverted, which is super chaotic in its own right. Like there's some quintessence out here that have been used to create these waste sticks. Sometimes there's like pairs of quintessence because it's making more than one of them before the off signal propagates. But eventually the goal is for there to be 12 Earths in a row in the bottom row. And because of the chaos, it's really hard to predict whether that's going to happen or not. 
Now, the easiest way to predict it is literally just to run the machine. And we can run it at a high speed and watch it go from high speed to slow speed to high speed to slow speed and back again with this super chaotic system. But again, the quintessence here is not entirely random. It'd be hard to even call it pseudo-random because it is completely predictable. I just don't have the systems of equations or whatever to predict it. And everything over here that just gets disposed of. Really, I would love to be able to dispose of everything, including this waste, but that's a lot to handle because like, again, look, you got three quintessence in this piece. There were three quintessence that showed up while it was off. I'm just really happy that I have something cool that doesn't crash, that is chaotic, and I, I went back to regular speed here because we're not far away from the point where it suddenly creates the right thing. Now we have the system over here feeding everything back, and we have the system over here sometimes throwing things away, sometimes giving them to the feedback loop. What we were looking for to see whether it will work is six or more Earth in a row on the bottom. And like we can get six or more of something. Here's seven eight even, here's eight air atoms in a row. But it's rarer to get Earth, just because whenever it's moving at this slower speed, the Birla wheel is synced up so that it is only creating air and water and fire. To be able to make Earth, it has to be pushing salt past at full speed, which only happens at the transitions. But with enough random-ish resets and enough transitions, you'll get longer runs of Earth. Here we go. We just hit four out of six for the first time, where six corresponds to there being 12 atoms in a row on the bottom. So four corresponds to eight in a row. It's a little bit strange with the game counts, but because the reset was timed perfectly, we now have all eight of those Earth in a row in the second half of the feedback loop, which means this is guaranteed to become the right thing. And lo and behold, five, six. So it's a natural question then, does this ever crash? Because now we've seen the natural question answered of does it ever create the right thing? Does it ever crash? Let's run it at an absurd speed because the game lets us. I really love mods, by the way. If you play this game and you think, oh, I really wish the interface was a little bit friendlier, come to the Discord community. We have people who are really good at making the mods and the modding framework is reasonably easy to install. But yeah, this thing that loops, its instructions aren't very long, by the way. It has 80 instructions on every arm and really that's just because some of these track loops have five arms on them and you really, it's awkward to program them out. The one that the hexagon track around a single arm, that one has five arms and there was not another way that I could give it a different number of arms. Like, if I were to try to make this hexagon track have five arms in it, or any, I mean, if it were supposed to have eight arms in it or four arms in it, it would fail. It needs to have five arms. This one, I could have made it into three arms, and that would have made it 100 or 240 instructions, which is too many. But each arm has 80 instructions. There are 64 arms. It's far less it took to program this than I get out in terms of complexity. So... All the complexity in this comes from just interactions of on their own simple systems, which to me is the absolute aesthetic that I was going for. And the fact that I was able to find something that takes several cycles, 2000 of them, and that, that corresponds to like 10 or 11 resets before it creates the desired output, but that it does eventually create the desired output. Mm, that's perfect. I really love cool, crazy machines. Also, you'll notice that the area is currently listed as 198. That's another mod. It disables area calculations. So none of this stuff takes up area and none of this stuff needs to be computed to take up area, which means that it's possible to run fast. Because if this stuff needed to be computing the amount of area it was taking up, that actually slows down the game a lot. So one of my friends in the community, Panic, who runs so many of the different events and has a lot of the tooling, has a simulator that was able to determine that the steady state period of this, once you account for all the atoms and the arms together, is 107,280 cycles. It takes that many cycles for it to reach a point that it has exactly already reached before modulo waste, because the waste stick is always going to get longer. But if you just ignore it and say that that's always going to get pushed off to infinity, 
the rest of the machine, the rest of the machine taken as a whole, takes 107,280 cycles to loop. I don't know from which um, from which cycle the loop starts, because obviously it doesn't start out in steady state. It starts out with almost the entire loop empty. But oh yeah, here we are on a point in the in the cycle where it makes the full output again. We did it. We touched grass in a chaotic way that doesn't happen every time. Now we touched hot grass because that's all fire on the bottom. Anyway, that's the duration of the loop. And it's just made from simple pieces interacting with each other. I know that the end result is machine size wise big, but I really think the concept of a clever design in this top right corner that can handle a feed rate of one atom every cycle and a clever design over here on the left that can slot in a template effectively with that calcifier. It can slot in something that copies whatever showed up on its left. And then this piece over here that creates quintessence and hits the reset switch. Just happened as I said it. Really good timing on my end. It leads to this, I don't know, I, I'm really tempted to like write Python code to simulate this without it needing to happen in game and be able to do some more advanced queries and instructions about it. Like, I want to know how often this middle piece is moving at full speed versus at half speed as a fraction of the infinite limit. I want to know how, like, what ratio exists on the bottom row between earth, air, water, fire, and salt. I think that earth is the rarest, so it is the most exciting that you can get a full run of earth through the output. But I don't know that. I, I would love to have someone run some analysis of this. Also, for what it's worth, if I take all of this and scooch it over by two more, that's how I originally had built it. And as I was running it, it just, it makes the exact same feedback loop with slightly different delays because it takes less time for the atoms to work their way around the full loop. But it never makes the output. A very slightly different machine which, thank goodness, I can do that adjustment and I don't have to reprogram anything. The programming as it is, is just completely generic. It does not care about the spacing. Honestly, if I wanted to, I could scooch this whole thing over any even number of... Like, I could do this. I haven't ever tried this before. I wonder how long it'll take to make the output. Or if it ever will. It made it at cycle 1990. This is faster than the one that I started with. Who could have ever guessed? I love this. I love it so much. It's so unpredictable and it makes me really want to understand it despite being hard to understand because it is an interaction based thing. <sighs> anyway, I'm geeking out. I should probably cut the video so that it doesn't go absurdly long, but thank you for watching. This is my aesthetic. My aesthetic is emergent complexity and I hope this solution made you happy.